Welcome to the Hallenstein Center's new online program, Lunch and Learn. I'm your host, Gleaves Whitney. During our quarantine, we may not be able to journey beyond our homes, but that should not stop us from journeying beyond our minds. Today's journey takes us deep into the heart of the way we communicate with one another in a democracy. Our guide is Grand Valley State University's Lisa Perhamus. Lisa is an associate professor in the Educational Foundations Department. She's a sociologist of education, and she's also director of the Padnos Sorosic Civil Discourse Program. She's also a big partner of ours at the Howenstein Center. Thank you. As Lisa likes to put it, she helped us that the spark course. My conversation with Lisa will go about uh, 20 or 30 minutes, followed by questions from our viewers. Our goal is not to go longer than about 45 minutes in all, so feel free to begin sending your questions to us right away using Zoom to do joining me. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Well, let's first define civil discourse. What is it? Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Civil discourse, think about it, that it's honest, robust, construct dialogue and deliberation with the purpose, right? The purpose is to advance the common good, the things that are in the public interest. Um, I'm actually gonna quote from our website, if that's okay. I just wanted to uh, say things about that definition, just sort of in everyday language. Um, it's an exchange of ideas, holds individuals accountable for their voice, so that's how we talk, right? Remains curious about other people's perspectives, which is how we, and respects multiple realities, just how we honor each other's personhood. So I think about civil discourse in the terms. Well, let's bracket that definition a little bit. What's its relation to, say, one hand, tough but necessary combinations? On the other hand, oh, good manners. So, when I good manners, I think people often confuse civil dislike. Being polite, your goal is to not upset others, right? To not offend. And, um, and it's very cautious, where civil discourse is about being really willing to make yourself vulnerable and take a chance. And um, it's more robust and more honest. And I think it requires a level of respect and trust in order to put your own ideas out there. You respect for the person that you're getting, to really be willing to do that. Otherwise, you just don't really care and you sort of back off and you sort of keep things superficial. But civil discourse is when you're really willing to sit down with the other people and engage. Well, when did you first become personally or professionally interested in the way we speak to one another in our civil discourse? Yeah. So I, this is an interesting question because certainly I think I've been interested in civil discourse long before I called it civil discourse. I think I thought a lot about how people are able to talk openly, listen intently, and how important that communication is between people. I think I can trace things back to my childhood, right? Um, I grew up in a very old fashioned kind of family where the children's job was to be seen and not heard. And I always wondered what that was about because I was a real person, I had things to say. And I always remember promising myself that when I grew up, I would recognize the personhood of all people. Um, I also had family members when I was growing up, served in the Vietnam War. So we had a lot of conversations about war and it really helped me realize how one single event, there could be a war, is experienced by so many different people in different ways, right? There's the people that served in the war, there are the victims of the war, there are the leaders during the war. And all of those perspectives are meaningful and they all contribute to the overall story of the larger picture, but not one in and of itself is accurate to explain the whole. So I was all really intrigued with what that whole picture was. And then finally in which um, I double majored in a religious studies. And when I was taking all of my religious studies classes, I really learned how many different ways people had sense, had you know, made sense of the world and um, how different belief systems were, but how rooted they were in some commonality, commonalities like the well-being of people, um, taking care of the earth and each other. Um, but from very different ways of going about it. So I was really intrigued by all of these different, really valid and meaningful contributions. You know, you're speaking of your younger life and it reminds me of some of the things that 
I thought about when I was, and yeah. um, uh, you know, you and I both share this this passion. You for what you call civil discourse. I for common ground. That's why we have a common ground initiative at the Hauenstein Center. And I think back. You know, I was the youngest by far of three kids, and I think back of literally feeling happy when my oldest fighting with each other okay. seriously uh, but there was also a conversation that occurred between my white parents and our black domestic help in 1965 mm -hmm. this was you know after the civil rights act and voting rights act and it's about at the same time that many of president johnson's great society reforms were being debated and mm -hmm. passed and i remember understanding that there were two very different viewpoints being expressed in our house with my parents on one side and, and Deborah on the other, and, and feeling that it was important that these three people I loved come to harmony over such a tough issue. So I think all of us have something in our background, something in our childhoods that sticks with us, and we're lucky, we're fortunate to be able to carry this work on in our professional lives. Right, yeah. and I think it's really interesting that you point to that story because it speaks to the power of words and of language and the way it shapes people's ideas. So had you not been curious to listen to both sides of the perspective in the, in the situation you just described, right, you could have easily fallen into stereotypes about race relations and things like that. But because you wanted to go deeper and get to know the individual people behind you, you have an opportunity to sort of unpack what those stereotypes are and get to know the the human being behind things, yes. which I think is important. That's yeah. right. Well, Lisa, tell us about your work here at Grand Valley with the, the Padna Sorosic Center for Civil Discourse. And why don't you tell us first what the program's mission is? Yeah, so our mission is to prepare students to be civically engaged, to build bridges of empathy and understanding across um, political and cultural differences using the tools of civil discourse. and. We aim to be um, meaningful for students and staff and faculty and community members, which is a really big task, right? So we're still working on that. Boys are striving to get better at that. And helping students, the idea is that students will become so equipped with the tools of civil discourse that they will become leaders and using civil discourse. And they will um, there's how to engage with people in conversation using civil discourse, sort of spreads like why yeah you know you could have gone a lot of different routes with that professional interest uh, why did you choose to work in a university to promote this yeah i think that um what be i tested out right so i was an adjunct and i taught for a little university and the i don't even know how to describe it but the power of those moments formation in students when that conversation and that light bulb go off in this cooking idea um, or seeing a new way the first time. It's a barren, it's very humbling. And I think it's so important in undergraduate students in particular at a really critical developmental stage um, and there's a real opportunity to be a part of how how young people are shaping their minds and and their future trajectory so it's really important in my mind listening to you i want to ask you how do you do it i mean when you're in the classroom or in a workshop how do you create these spaces that spark productive civil discourse right so it's a tough call and it's sometimes easier to do than others, but I think it's really important for three things to be present in creating those conditions for productive conversations, right? The opportunity to be authentic, right? Everyone needs the opportunity to be who they really are and you invite others to be authentic with you by being that yourself, right? Um, and to be accountable for your own voice and to hold each other accountable for your own voice and curiosity, always remain curious about the other person. So many times I hear people, um, you know, you raise your hand and you're waiting for your turn to speak, but really you're waiting for your turn to say what it is you want to say. You've only sort of heard what the person before you has said, right? So I think that true dialogue means that I'm starting out with curiosity. That's my lead. I first want to learn from you. And then I feel like I want to share part of myself with you. And then the conversation grows from there. What do you think makes civil discourse so hard? 
Yeah. So the way I think about civil discourse, I, I almost think about a tree and it has its roots and the tree grows up, right? And, and so if you're walking on land, you see the tree. And I feel like civil discourse is the tree above the ground. Those are all the words we use to talk with each other, um, explain ourselves, communicate what we want to say. But what's driving those words, the values that are underneath those words, the values that are shaping our perspectives, those are the tree roots. That's what's under the ground and we, they're not so visible, they're not at the surface. And so I think that um, it's really easy to get tangled up with each other's words when we're staying at the surface. And then the real trick is to get down to what is underneath that? What is the story behind that particular perspective? Where is that coming from for you? And I think that that's the real work, is learning how to um, take a break, maybe if it's getting a little contentious, but taking a break without walking away. Um, and when people stay at the top and they don't understand where those ideas are coming from, they make assumptions, you're more likely to get upset and angry, and it's more apt to be a mess. It's much harder to be really upset with somebody who says, listen, here's where this story is coming from for me. You know, when I was 12, or I've seen this happen, or this happened to me, um, then it's a human story. Stories humanize things. And then there's more of an opportunity for that conversation to grow. Mm. Well, with all the experience you've had sparking civil discourse, Tell us your best story. Okay, so forgive me, Gleaves. I've told Gleaves this story before, but I'm going to repeat it because it is by far the most impactful. It's a story that happened in the classroom. I'm a teacher, so I have a lot of classroom stories. So forgive me for sharing a classroom story. Um, but one of the most powerful teaching experiences I've ever had happened right after the 2016 election, presidential election. And it was a Friday morning that first week. And I walked into class and it was a small seminar class. There were 15 students. And we had really grown to know each other as a community. So it was a pretty safe feeling most of the time, but not everybody thought the same way, right? There were a lot of different opinions and political orientations and cultural backgrounds. It was just a real mix in the classroom. And um, I, I had a feeling we were gonna end up talking about the election because everyone was talking about the election and I wanted to make space for that in the classroom. But here's what I was not prepared for. The first student walked in wearing a Make America Great Again hat, right? And um, very clearly was happy. He was celebrating because his candidate had won. And maybe two or three students later, a student walked in wearing anti-Trump t-shirt. And I thought, okay, even if we didn't say a word in this classroom, it's visibly present, it's palpable right here, these two different um, perspectives. And I knew we had to hash it out. And, and I really felt that my job was, the, the important thing was that each student was valued and honored and taken seriously and that their opinion was respected. But to do that in a way that didn't cancel out the other person and which is a real trick because you had two opposing viewpoints and then the rest of the students I didn't know where they fell but I figured somewhere in the middle right so we really had to have a conversation where the young woman wearing the anti-Trump t-shirt could talk about what her where that was coming from for her what were her feelings what were her fears why was she feeling upset why was this so hard for her and for the other student, why was he so uh, excited that Trump had won? Like, what was this about for him? Like, what did he believe in that was now coming to fruition that was exciting for him? And, and how could we, as to use your phrase, come together in some common ground without expecting each other to change each other's minds, yes. which is a real trick, right? We, we're not there to change other people's minds. We're there to make ourselves understood and to understand the other people which is a real difference. And in that class, there were a lot of tears. People were crying, people were sharing uh, stories, people were really, I think it was an emotionally raw time for a lot of people, so the emotions were already heightened, which makes civil discourse a little bit of an extra challenge, but they did it, and I was so proud of them. They really stuck to hearing the human being behind the words that were being spoken. 
And that's the real trick for civil discourse, I think. Well, you're mentioning now uh, these partisan differences. I'm curious, Lisa, what do you think the single most important thing we can do as Americans to bring about better communication between you know, Republicans, Democrats, independents? Yeah, so I was reading an interesting article yesterday um, that I wanna share uh, one of the lines from the article that said, this is not my political divide and it's not your political divide. It is our political divide. We share it. And that means we are all gonna take a part in solving it. So I think that's the first thing I wanna to try to keep in mind is that this political divide is experienced and felt by many people from all, the, uh, all different political orientations. And it's divisive for any, everyone. And we're all looking for some ways to um, communicate with one another and make societal progress and being able to talk to each other. So I would say a couple of things. I was prepared for you to ask me this question. So if you don't mind, I'm going to refer to my notes. I wrote down a couple of things because I think this is really important. And especially since we have another election coming up, right? Learn about the issue. Uh, diversify your news outlets, right? Listen to many different perspectives and try not to be insulated. It's really easy to, I know I have a tendency to surround myself with like-minded people, but I really need to be intentional about learning about an issue from multiple perspectives. Speak from your own perspective, right? Use I statements, try not to generalize, try not to point fingers, tell stories. Stories are really effective ways to communicate. Be purposeful with your language. Um, try using, uh, try avoiding loaded terms. So by that I mean, for example, instead of saying, let's talk about gun control, which is immediately divisive, right? People know exactly where they stand on the issue of gun control. But if you go underneath to those roots that I was talking about before and you say, I wanna talk about how we can reduce um, deaths of children by gunshot. Then you have a lot more people on board wanting to talk about how to keep children safe. People have different ideas about how to do that, but that's a more shared value about um, that, I don't know, that commitment to keeping kids safe. Ask genuine questions. I think it's really important, as I said before, to be curious and avoid absolutist language. Those words that, you know, all, never, always, nobody, you know, uh, very, very infrequently is life so, you know, absolute there's a lot more gray area in real life. So the more we can remember that with each other, the more we can talk across political divides, I think. I have a feeling our viewers are getting a whole semester's worth of instruction now, <laughs> all packed into a few minutes. Sorry, you know, talk, I talk with my hands, which is probably really distracting. I'm sorry, everyone. Yeah. No, 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 it was a great overview. Well, Lisa, that brings to me to my next question. What, what combination of personality traits and intellectual skills does a, a person need to be good at the kind of work you do and at, good at drawing out civil discourse among people who maybe don't even like each other? Yeah, true enough. So um, the stick to itiveness I think, is really important because you don't want to get up and run the first time you have a disagreement or when things get tough. Things are going to get tough, and sometimes it is okay to stop and take a deep breath. Sometimes that's really important to do, but stick with it, right? Don't walk away. Keep that engagement. Um, a willingness to become patient, and by that I mean, I don't think it's very realistic, at least it's not realistic for me to say, Lisa, be patient all the time, because I'm simply not patient all the time, but I'm willing to become patient in moments that call for it. Um, and my willingness to do that plays an important role in how much I'm able to listen um, to other people. And I would come back to courage. I think you need to be courageous in making yourself vulnerable and being willing to put yourself out there a little bit because no change is going to come without some discomfort. And the change is about us putting our ideas together, right? Um, the more the more diverse the perspectives are that we're sort of gathering around us, the more creative our solutions can be. Um, and in terms of intellectual skills, I think about curiosity again. I think about the importance of critical thinking. And I think reflection is a really important piece. Um, you know, after, it's hard to reflect while we're talking, but certainly after a conversation, it's important to reflect. And maybe you wanna go back to that person and clarify a few things or 
think through it. Like, where was that coming from for myself? And how do I want to handle that differently the next time? So that we're always growing. Your work is, of course, in downtown Grand Rapids and in Allendale, but you've also been working in Detroit. Tell us a little bit about your Detroit work and how it relates to civil discourse. Yeah. So you mentioned that I was a sociologist. So that tells you I'm interested in the way uh, communities function and I'm interested in what the challenges are in community resiliency and what makes communities resilient. And so Detroit is a really rich and exciting place for me to be doing work because it is all about resiliency, um, right? Detroit has almost 1500 urban gardens, for example, and you think about um, how that's growing a community as you're growing your uh, garden, you're reconnecting with the land, which is really important. Um, and you're putting money when, when the urban farmers sell their um, product to local restaurants or the Eastern market in Detroit, they're circulating money in the local economy, right? It just really plays an important role in all different kinds of things. So I'm drawn to um, initiatives that promote community revitalization. And I have the opportunity right now, specifically, I have my sabbatical research um, happening in Detroit, and I'm studying two people that lived in Detroit. They have since passed away, uh, James and Grace Lee Boggs. And they were really active in trying to keep their uh, community in Detroit resilient. And they worked with youth, they worked with elders, they worked on a lot of different issues, but the, the whole idea was about um, helping people reach their full humanity and growing and developing healthy neighborhoods. And where they lived in Detroit is filled with local history about all of the conversations they've had with people throughout the years and all of the different organizations they worked with through this. It's the really rich history for Detroit. And so, um, the folks in Detroit that are, have been doing this work for a long time are interested in turning their home into a community museum. And I'm very lucky to be part of that project. So I'm archiving material that is going to become part of that community museum because it's a community legacy. And that can be a place where school children visit on field trips. Um, families can come together. Teachers can bring students. You know, it would just be a really great space for the community in that way. So I'm really honored to do that. What's next, say, after your sabbatical? Oh, that's a great question. I'm really interested in continuing to grow the civil discourse program. Um, as I said before, we're always looking for ways to be even more present on campus, be even more meaningful for students. And I think a real growth opportunity is, and maybe this can be part of our conversation here together with everyone that's here, is I'd really like to have the program become more relevant and meaningful to community members. So how can we continue to break down that divide between university and town, as they say, right? So how can, even though we are here primarily for students, that is not all we're here for. And the students learn in community. And so having the community involved with the program is really important. So I'm looking for ways the program can grow in ways that can be more relevant to community members. So that's my biggest focus right now. And beyond that, what would be your dream of doing, I don't know, the capstone of your work? What, what yeah. would that look like? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I'm not sure of the exact thing it would look like, the exact project, but I know it's qualities, right? It's qualities would be, it would be a space of intergenerational learning um, where youth and older people are learning from each other. I would really like to see, I'm in the College of Education at Grand Valley, I should back up and say that. So I'm really focused a lot on young people um, and what they learn from adults in their lives. And so I would really love to see a space where educational policymakers, for example, listen to, to kids and what they had to say with validity and learn from them. And I'd really like to see kids develop more of an appreciation of the wisdom of their elders and learn how to listen to them and have a space where people are sharing their stories as a way to connect intergenerationally because there's a lot of wisdom to be shared in that way. That's what I would dream of doing. 
Where can people go online to learn more about your work? Yeah. So um, the Civil Discourse Program is located in the Brooks College at Grand Valley. So you can go to uh, gvsu.edu backslash civil discourse. And then that'll get you there. But if you throw in another black slash, it'll get you there directly. So it's really just Grand Valley at Civil Discourse and you'll find our website. And there are a lot of resources on there. So I encourage you to explore. Very good. Well, Lisa, we have a lot of viewers queued up to ask questions. So let's bring them into our conversation. One viewer asks, uh, the 2020 presidential election is sure to be contentious. Are there resources through the Padnos Sorosic Civil Discourse for, for students on campus who want to create spaces for civil discourse? Yes, that's an excellent question that I can only partially answer right now because we always have a fall symposium, and the symposium this year was all about exactly that viewer's question, right? Creating this space, it was gonna be in the fall, right before the election, for students to be able to really hash out what they're thinking and grow to understand why. I always say, I don't care what you think, but I do care a lot about why you think what you think. So it's gonna be a space about that. And um, But with the uh, coronavirus pandemic, we are not sure whether that's going to be able to happen in the fall. So we're probably going to push that back to the spring. So I'm thinking of something smaller scale. If we're able to be back face to face, right? And we all miss each other. So that would be great to do. Um, I would really like to have like a coffee house night where we would have some food and maybe some very quiet music playing where people can just have conversation and have some political folks in the room so we can facilitate the conversation. And then I think of more pop-up opportunities throughout the campus working with students, um, like tabletop conversations that we can set up all around campus to do that. But right now everything's contingent on um, being back full swing in the fall, right? And otherwise, I'm gonna have to get really creative and I open myself to invitation for ideas, right? About how we can do this virtually if we need to. You and I are really working on ways to approach this coming election and making sure that students have a voice and they get to hear people who disagree with them yeah. so that they can make an informed choice when they get into that, you know, cast their ballot. Um, we've got some uh, two questions here that really I can merge into one. Uh, Felinda Gerling says, please talk about name calling and civil discourse and how that can be addressed. And then another viewer writes in a very similar vein, what do you do in civil discourse when someone switches to personal attacks rather than staying on topic? Right. So name calling is a form of personal attack. So that question makes sense, those questions together. And that's a conversation stopper. There's just no question about it. It just stops the conversation. Personal attacks are not okay under any circumstances. And I think when that has happened to me, something I've tried to do is to say, could we stay focused on and then whatever the issue is and, and sort of try to keep the conversation there? If the other person is not willing to go there with me and is not willing to engage, I have to sometimes say to myself, I'm going to step away from this conversation momentarily and I tell the other person, I'm going to take a breather, right? Because this conversation is feeling hard for me right now because I am feeling, you can go ahead and say how you're feeling. I'm feeling personally attacked or... Um, I don't like the name calling, but sometimes you don't feel quite so bold, right? You just want to take the break. And then when you come back, the best thing that I know to do is to model with your own actions and, and, and interactions and word choice the way that you want to have the other person interact with you. Sometimes that is enough and you can go great places with each other in a conversation. And sometimes the reality is it's not going to happen right there, right then. But I always remind myself, that's a moment in time. So that conversation in that moment, at that time, reached a stalemate, possibly. And you knew to take a break, and that was the constructive thing to do, because the whole point is keep it constructive, right? You, there's no point in getting into a big fight that, that just hurts everybody. Um, but to keep it constructive and um, remember that you might be able to come back to that conversation at another time with that person and have it go better. You know, at the Hallenstein Center and our Common Ground Initiative, we've uh, brought in Bob Quinn from the University of Michigan mm -hmm. to talk about techniques for bringing people together who won't otherwise get along. 
And Bob always starts out with core stories. If you know that two people are gonna have a tough time in a conversation, have them get to know each other and learn to trust each other with some of their yeah. core stories of their own identity, where that came from. A lot of times that identity came from a, you know, a very painful place. And I, I, I think that if, if the students or our community members start on that basis, then it doesn't escalate so easily to the name calling and the disrespect and you know, to the point where what you're describing where you have to just get up and walk away. Right, I completely agree. A really good question here. Another viewer asks, what was the turning point in our society that pushed us to become so polarized? Mm. That's such an interesting question. And to be honest, I feel like I'm not as good of a student of history as Gleaves is. So this might be a question we answer together. Because I think that there have been a number of points in history where we've been sort of here before. Um, so I, I think that we're feeling it in a really intense way at this political time because there is so much at stake and this is such a contentious time and the coronavirus is adding to that right people are scared people are really thinking about how we can heal together and have different ways to do that um, but i don't know if there has been a single moment in history that sort of switched it like that. I think that there are turning points in history on a continuum along the way. Um, I think that right now, mm, that's a really hard question to answer about what's making it so tough right now. I think that people seem to be more emboldened to say what they're really thinking and feeling and that seems to be what they lead with before leading with, how can I listen and learn first? How can I say this in a way that's constructive? It seems like people are picking an issue, saying what they think about the issue, and then, oh, that doesn't work, and so they're getting all tangled up with each other. And really, we all just need to take a pause at this moment. If we're gonna talk about immigration, let's take a deep breath, let's step back, let's consider all of the different issues, and let's talk about that Let's not talk, have a, a, a fight or a conversation about whether or not there should be a wall. Let's talk about what that wall represents. That wall represents immigration and what we want to do with uh, borders and national security and human beings and all of the different perspectives that we take. So try to not keep it so simple, right? Try to go deeper. Yeah, and, you know, historically speaking. Yes, we thank you. No, no, this is, this is a good conversation. Historically, there have been times in American history, believe it or not, that have been a lot worse than today. It's hard for us to see that because we're, we're in the moment, we're, we're, our adrenaline's going. But um, if you go all the way back, you know, you see in the Civil War, for example, a total breakdown where right. it really came to, to guns, obviously. Uh, 626,000 people died in that war, more than all the other wars that the Americans have fought together. Then you look at, um, say, oh, during the, the very beginning of our country where you had, within Washington's cabinet, you had Hamilton and Jefferson. Hamilton had his Federalist Party that was starting to form. Jefferson had his Democratic Republicans. Oh, it got scurrilous. It got really nasty. Yeah. The things that Hamilton's allies were saying about Jefferson and vice versa, and then when the Federalist John Adams ran for president, uh, it, it got even nastier. Jeffersonians were saying horrible things about him and the favors were returned going the other direction. Then when Roosevelt, uh, Theodore, uh, um, Franklin Roosevelt now, was president, just, you know, uh, 90 years ago, there were a lot of hard feelings about that. And in some ways, in living memory, we still haven't overcome those hard feelings. Here's a little fact for you. If you just go back in living memory, say 88 years, 90 years, 44 of those years, a Democrat has been in the White House, and 44 year of those years, a Republican has been in the White House. Now, uh, a liberal like Franklin Roosevelt dominated certainly in the 30s and the 40s, and a Republican, a conservative like Ronald Reagan dominated in the 80s, early 90s with Bush. But for the most part, Americans have been straddling this divide. And the longer you look at it, the longer you see we have been a divided people, a very divided people. And finally, I would say, I'm old enough to remember the 1960s. And I mean, the undergraduate 
program I went to, the university I went to, Old Main had been burned down after the Kent State riots. Right. So there was a lot of violence in the 1960s, the late 60s. And I, I remember being seared by that, thinking it's really difficult to think about our future as students when you have so much violence, but you just want to survive. Yeah. So it puts it a little bit in perspective. It's in no way to underestimate the damage that we're doing to each other nowadays. And in some, some ways it's been exacerbated by, you know, the clickbait and the trolling and being anonymous when you're, you're responding to other people. You, you just be a jerk so easily nowadays. But um, it could get worse. I'm hoping it'll get better. That's why you and I are in the business we're in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, one other question here that does not cover the territory that uh, we have so far covered. This viewer asks, if we've had a conversation and we feel as if it's ended in a bad place with someone, is it ever appropriate to invite someone like you to join the conversation at a later time to help facilitate that civil discourse? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I think that it's important for both people to feel comfortable with that arrangement first, right? You don't wanna have, uh, say, say, say you call on me, right? I don't wanna be pulled into a situation where only one of you knows I'm coming. <laughs> Right, it needs to be something that we all three feel comfortable with, but absolutely, and I think that 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 shows a real openness and commitment to um, what true engagement with another human being looks like. It's messy and it's hard, and it doesn't go well the first time every every time, right? But the trick is not to get it right in a perfect way. The trick is to keep trying. Right, and so I think that um, whether it's a trusted friend or it's somebody who does this for a living or you know, whether it's somebody from your faith community, whoever it is that you wanna bring in, that's often very helpful when two people really want to sort it through with each other. I agree. Lisa, is there anything else you wanted to tell us uh, that we haven't covered? Um, I don't think so. I just wanted to say thank you very much for letting me be part of this conversation. And I wish I could see all of your faces, but thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Lisa Perhamus, for sharing your story and inspiring our listeners. The people who've heard you can see now, I think, why you're such a valued colleague of ours at Grand Valley. You're Thanks great. also to our viewers whom I invite to Zoom in or join us on Facebook at the same time on Thursday, April 23rd, when my guest will be Dami Olufasuse. Dami is an international student who is in just a few days, will earn her Master of Public Health and graduate from the Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy. She'll be a full fellow then, and Dami will share her unique perspective on how two different federal healthcare systems are responding to this global pandemic. So till Thursday at 1 p.m., stay tuned and stay well.